Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Herriot. You're listening to Opera Night live on RTE Lyric FM. And a very warm welcome to Wexford and to this Wexford Festival Opera 2018. Currently celebrating its 67th season. And as always, at this time of the year, you join us live from the magnificent National Opera House here in the town centre, and where we welcome not only our listeners on Lyric, but through our association with the European Broadcasting Union and as part of the premium opera series, those of you who join us now across Europe this evening, listening in Spain, Croatia, Germany, Canada, Russia, Bulgaria, Denmark, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Poland, as well, of course, as those of you who join us right now live on the video stream of rt.ie forward slash culture. You are all very welcome to Wexford. Well, during its run over a two-week period this year, this renowned operatic event has certainly lived up to its citation as Festival of the Year 2017, with another extraordinary programme that reflects perfectly the range and variety for which Wexford has become so renowned. Presenting some of the very best operas almost never seen, or at least very rarely. Well, tonight, and in what is regarded as classic Wexford style, we look forward to an opera from one of those composers who's become very well known to audiences here. In fact, this is the sixth presentation of a work by Severio Mercadante, and that's a tradition that began back in 1988. Il Bravo, or The Assassin, is often compared to works by Verdi in terms of its musical style, and despite its quintessentially Italian title, the plot is originally drawn from a James Fenimore Cooper novel. In other words, here we have an opera based on American literature of the 19th century, but derived from a much more ancient tale, a play set in 16th century Venice. La Venetienne, the Bravo, a colloquialism, the name for an assassin, here a tormented character who had long ago killed his wife in a fit of jealousy. Unjustly accused of plotting against the hostage to compel his obedience. And so, in Act One, a group of local ruffians, for want of a better expression, gather in the square of the Holy Apostles in Venice. Well, they've been summoned there by Foscari, a Venetian patrician who arrives and promise them, promises them a great reward for their endeavours. Well, written in three acts, with its libretto by Gitano Rossi and Marco Marcello, and first performed at La Scala Milan back in 1839, our creative team this evening is led for the fourth time here in Wexford by the duo who are indeed themselves actually based in Venice, Barb and Doucet. Director Renaud Doucet and set and costume designer André Barbe. And the initial image that they present us with right now interlinks a Venice of the past with the present. The famous Piazza San Marco dominated Aron Levrien.
paradiso.
Oh, oh. 
And so at the end of Act One of Severio Mercadante's Il Bravo, the title character, the Bravo himself, is held responsible for murder, but nevertheless, Violetta is not seeking any kind of vengeance, but merely a place where she can withdraw from the world for the rest of her days. However, unbeknownst to her, the Bravo offers his protection and she accepts, much to the irritation of the establishment and for Scari in particular. But it seems no matter the guise, the crowd always defers to Il Bravo. Set in 16th century Venice, the Bravo of the title here is that tormented character who long ago killed his wife in a fit of jealousy and unjustly accused of plotting against the state He's been forced by the Council of Ten to become their secret hard assassin while his father is held hostage to assure his obedience. Were well, written in three acts, with its libretto by Gaetano Rossi and Marco Marcello, this was first performed at La Scala Milan back in 1839. Our creative team this evening is led by a Venetian-based duo, Barb and Duce, and our cast this evening includes Il Bravo, Rubens Palizzari, Foscari is Gustavo Castillo, Pisani, Alessandro Luciano, Luigi is Simon Neklinski, Theodora Yasco Sato, and Violetta Ekaterina Bakanova, with the Wexford Festival Opera Orchestra and leader Fanula Hunt under the direction of Jonathan Brandani. And now, during our first interval this evening, we took the opportunity earlier on in the week to catch up with this Venetian-based duo, André Barb and Renaud Doucet, so well-placed, of course, to interpret this story, and who are certainly no strangers to the opera festival here in Wexford. <laughs> Renaud Doucet and André Barb, uh, Barb and Doucet, which is a well-known collaborative team here at Wexford. Welcome back to Ireland, to Lyric for the very first time. And it's a real pleasure to talk to the creative force behind one of the highlights of this year's festival. Il Bravo. And I would suggest that probably the two of you are the best place to interpret this story of anyone I can think of for all sorts of reasons. And we'll come to that a little bit later on. But I wanted to start with this piece by uh, Mercadante to begin with. Il Bravo. Uh, it's actually based around a James Fenimore Cooper novel, which would suggest the 19th century. But actually, in fact, the story is based on a much more ancient tale that takes us back to Venice in the 16th century. But I want to begin with the title character himself, if I may, Rano, and to ask you about Il Bravo himself. Who is he? The Bravo is the legal assassin that is hired by the Council of Ten to get rid of the people who are mostly in the way of those 10 most important families. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really this um, hired assassin in fact, he does not have much choice than to do it. We will discover it through the plot of the opera. But uh, it's, an, it's a character that existed, that was real. There is a beautiful, beautiful painting by Tiziano called Il Bravo. Uh, because when we were doing the research, then it was very interesting to, to look at this painting where we see a, a, a young gentleman that is pulled by the shoulder and we do not see the bravo, we see just the shadow of this man and we see the dagger that will uh, kill this gentleman. So, uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating to, to go back to this, uh, to this story in Venice because, in fact, a lot of people forgot about those things. Do you know, you immediately want to draw um, contemporary parallels and I think of something like a, a former day James Bond, for example. I mean, not quite as obviously as present as that. This is uh, for a slightly different reason. But nevertheless, the idea, the charisma that lies behind a hard ass assassin or someone who is licensed to kill. 
Something that is important, you know, in the opera of Mercadante is also, it's the typical bel canto opera. It is the typical big story of the bel canto opera. And we wanted to make sure that we were very faithful to the, the first ideas of presenting also a Venice of the 16th century. Uh, it is not only the Venice of 16th century, but at some point, you know, we wanted to show what it was. Um, it's an opera that is never done, okay? Like, this is the specialty of Wexford. So it is also important when you're bringing back a piece to be able to have the sense of what is the, the, the origin and the nature of the piece itself. Now, you've suggested there already the very particular setting here and the feel of that. And that's why I wanted to talk to you, Andre, about the, uh, the set and the costume design here. Um, Venetian 16th century, we don't know that exactly, that depends on you. But there's no question, and as I said to begin with, that uh, you're both a better place than most, perhaps, certainly to research this, because it is actually where you live. Yes, we can call Venice home since three years, and it's quite a pleasure. I, th I think Renaud and I keep pinching ourselves every morning when we wake up and we look at the view from our living room windows where we do see the Campanile and, and the, the Duomos of, uh, of the cathedral. It's fantastic. It was easier for us to do the research because some of the action described in the libretto are actually places we go daily with our dog for walks. The Campo Santi Apostoli, of course. The Ponte della Guerra. Is uh, uh, 30 seconds from home. Yes, exactly. And, and, and Piazza San Marco or places that we visit daily. And it, it's very easy for us to know. So we, we had to do a bit of research about which palaces we wanted to use for, for example, for Theodora's palace. But we went, we end up looking at the Palazzo Grimani, which is our neighbors. And we visited it one afternoon and we were simply back in time. So One of the Palazzo Pisani is really, uh, is very, very close from home. In fact, it's, yeah, it's on the, on the way when we, uh, when we go to Fondamenta Nuove or walking the dogs and we, we pass in front of Palazzo Pisani. That's it's amazing to think of something of such a period, such a place and such a time in terms of research as being on the doorstep. And it makes me wonder immediately, had you ambitions uh, to do this particular piece for quite some time or did it just crop up and it all slotted into place? No, in fact, you know, it's David Agler who came up with the, with the idea because there is a very big tradition of Mercadante at the Wexford Festival Opera. We were looking at different operas about Venice. Uh, let's be honest on this, because it has been a city that has inspired so many composers. Um, but because of the, the tradition of Mercadante in Wexford, it was a good moment to do that. Uh, it's also a piece that requires big chorus. There is a lot of chorus scenes, and this is also one of the trademark of at least one of the big productions of Wexford. In fact, this time is going to be two because uh, the double bill also is using a lot of chorus. Um, so we, de we decided to go on with, uh, with Il Bravo for that. But what's fascinating in Venice is that when, wherever you walk, you, you are always confronted to the present and the past. Mm. Uh, just in our apartment alone, you know, uh, we were told we're coming, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, Modigliani, Rubinstein. They were all in our living room. They all lived in the very same yes, place. Yes, they were all. Okay. Well, they, they, they were they, not living there, they, but they came to visit the owner of the place who was a, a famous very, painter. So and you're looking at the same view, basically. Yes, yes. we are. And but Franz Liszt was living just in front, in Palazzo Ivancic. So uh, we have a friend who, uh, who lives at Palazzo Moncenigo, where Monteverdi presented his uh, operas, uh, Combattimento, and created a lot of operas. So we're surrounded by the past, but at the same time, it is also the very present of Venice that is interesting. That's what we wanted to show in, in our production, because... Tourists who are flooding to Venice these days, because there are too many tourists, are coming and crowding the streets, not having a clue 
who were there before. You know, we have the feeling sometimes that when we're crossing a street that Casanova, Casanova is going to turn on, on, on the corner because he was actually imprisoned in the, in the, in the uh, prison that was quite near where we live. So we wanted to accentuate that and to say because Venice has no car, it's a city that has hardly changed in 300 years. And so one of the challenges of this is bringing the Venice that you know and experience today and that is relevant despite what it may look like or how similar it may look to the past into the present, bringing this story into the present. The, the Venice is a major character of the story. Uh, there is, of course, the, the, the whole story and the plot within the different characters but Venice is definitely a big part of the story. Um, and we wanted to, to, to speak also about, yes, the mass tourism. That not, does not only happen in Venice. Barcelona has the same problem. The difficulty that, that uh, we, have to, we have to face was to be able to speak about that and at the same time not twist the story to the point that it is not recognized anymore. Um, I always, we, with André, we always say a good concept is a concept that flows. At some point, you know, you have to recognize the story. You have to know what it is about. And the music, the bel canto music, is really fitting, you know, this story and is enlarging, making bigger than life, uh, the, the, make those characters bigger than life. So... It is important to be able to stay faithful to the score. So are you telling me, for you at any rate, it all begins with the score? Of course, naturally. Always. Our job is to say, how is this piece relevant to a modern audience? How will they understand it? Will they have the codes of today? The codes that were known then, will they understand these codes today? Or do, do we have to help them in a way to understand what the codes were? And what does this story bring to the modern audience. It's very interesting because there are a lot of messages in Il Bravo, like don't take too hasty decision, you may regret it at the end, uh, which is, you know, something that we live daily because sometimes we take hasty decision and maybe we should not. Um, the fact that we're facing, we're not looking anymore with our eyes. We don't take the time to look at things. Now, the city became a background for selfies. People put themselves, you know, they stage themselves in the city, but the museums are empty. The museums are empty. And one of the things that's so interesting about the story is also the fact that the Bravo itself is, is a very visible character. Well, you'd have to be in terms of an opera how you will actually choose to portray him visually. You know, will he be a black character or a red no. character? Or, you know. it, it, we, the, there is research that is existing about that, and we were very surprised, I think, when we saw it, because yes. there, there's also, uh, we're very fortunate, because in Venice we had the pleasure and the, the chance to collaborate with people in the workshops who made the costumes who are specialists in the Renaissance period. And, and we had access to wonderful research and books. And the official, I, I will only tell you that the official costumes for El Bravo was like a parrot in terms of colors. It was amazing. And I, you, would have been, you would have imagined that he would have been dressed in black or in very somber colors, but that's not the, the in case. In fact, at the period, he was blue, green, red, and with a very big hat. Honestly, you could see him so far away. He just had a mask. Okay, But, you know, it's interesting because in the, even in the 19th century standard, they speak about a shadow, they speak about something that is, much, much, that is much darker because it was not even in the standard of the 19th century. It would be even less in our standards now. So it's very interesting. What was considered right at the time would be looked out as something extremely strange now. But there were no street lights in those days. Exactly. And so people were walking outside. If they had the chance, they had servants who were holding, you know, torches or candles. So anybody walking in the street at that time would look like a shadow. So, but it's true that this, this tradition has changed so much in the And 19th. not forgetting also the very big, the use of the mask. The use of the mask is something that in Venice was very important. Look, half of the year was carnival. Mm. Okay, so, you know, in fact, it was to hide yourself and you could be whoever you wanted to be.
It was the Las Vegas of the time, and when you think about it, because people came to see plays or you know uh, theater and opera, and they they came to gamble, and of course they came have to sex. have a good time and have sex because the the, the number of prostitutes that were existing in, exactly. in Venice was amazing compared to the population. It's really interesting to see, you know, that there is a bridge that is called Ponte delle Tette, which is the bridge of the breasts. Okay, because the coup the the courtesan were going on the bridge and exposing themselves, you know, but you still, we still go on our boat and we cross under the Ponte delle Tete and you see Rio delle Tete and you see, so everything was there, you know, people were coming from all over Europe to see some of the most famous courtesan. And uh, so it, it's interesting when we look at Theodora, the character, you know, to see also the courtesan, to look at their very specific hairdos and how they were going, those enormous platform shoes, you know, that they were walking on, you know. So we've put some of them on stage and they were wearing pants. Some of them were absolutely wearing pants, which was uh, the, the trousers. privilege, trousers, yeah, uh, <laughs> the privilege of those ladies. So it's very, you know, working in Venice and having access to also older the research that we, we, we could find, that, that was really fantastic. I think we couldn't do the Bravo without exploring the Renaissance world of Venice because it's so much part of it. And I think to have done simply a, a, a modern version of it, we would have lost a lot of this information. And if great cultural centers have their golden era, then of course the Renaissance for Venice was it. Yes, exactly. 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 Totally. It was only a downfall after. Yes. There is an unusual structure to this in terms of the fact that the four main characters, two sopranos, two tenors, how does that work? I have to say it's quite challenging. First, it's quite challenging for the cast. And uh, it is very interesting to see that, you know, the, the classical uh, breakdown of voices, especially for the period, was not respected. And to have those two tenors that are almost like almost father-son, and then you have the two soprani that are uh, mother-daughters, was very interesting. And it, I have to say, Mercadante creates some of the most beautiful duets. Uh, you will see in Act Two, there is a, gorge, a gorgeous, gorgeous duet, a prayer in between the two ladies that is really stunning, stunning. And uh, I have to say, it is extremely demanding for the cast. It is vocally uh, very hard. Uh, when I was looking at the score the first time, I was like, whoa, this is heavy. And we don't think about Mercadante in being this very uh, uh, difficult composer to sing. But on this score, it is a heavy one. And in, in what terms do you mean that? Athletic terms? It is or? athletic. For example, the role of the Bravo is also sitting on a testura that is not easy and it's very long. It is very long and it's always very strong with a strong orchestration under. Okay. Uh, the part of Theodora, which is asking a very a full lyric voice, but at the same time with a lot of coloratura. You don't know exactly if it's a soprano or if it's a mezzo role, but who needs to go to a high C. Uh, in fact, you're supposed to have this kind of super incredible voices, okay, to be able to do that. Um, the very beautiful part of Violetta and uh, Ekaterina Bakanova is absolutely splendid. Ekaterina Bakanova, who came in also late in the process, because that was also a cast change, and who really is doing a beautiful, beautiful work, uh, I have to say, but has so many areas, duets, quatuor, ensemble, it never stops. So it is physically really draining for them. And it's very demanding for the chorus as well, because they the, do move a lot and the, the action is very demanding and, and vocally it's very strong. It's important that it is musically very tight and very precise, because uh, with the orchestration, really, you need to have this precision. But at the same time, this cannot be a park and bark opera version, okay, where the chorus is only standing them doing nothing. In fact, they need to be extremely involved in the action, which makes it very physical for them. So 
every part of the action and all the movements in the staging have to be done accordingly to the, the, the musicality of the piece, as well also as respecting the breakdown of voices to make sure that the balance is, is, uh, is good. So there is a big uh, uh, planification to be uh, done before we can even start to go to the rehearsal room. So that was, a, that was a challenging one to prepare, especially because also we were, we were working with manuscripts and, you know, uh, Jonathan Brandini had to redo and re recopy the entire orchestra scores. So all those parts are new. So it was really digging, digging, digging into every piece of information possible for everybody to put it back together. It has been... I have to say, maybe, uh, for me, it has been the biggest, biggest job in the last 20 years to put this piece back because of the structure and the essence of the opera. When we looked at it at the beginning and we say, OK, we're going to be close to 200 costumes here. And we don't even, we have, have we, as we know in Waxford, it is not a chorus of 60 people. But some of those chorus people have five costumes each because there is so many changes. So it is a very, very big undertaking to bring Il Bravo back to the stage. This is also one of the reasons why a lot of companies don't want to do this type of operas, because they're massive. And to be able to do them in Waxford, to be able to present them to the, to the audience, that come especially to the city to see this type of event is something that is quite fantastic. In a way, you've answered a question before because it occurred to me, of course, you were speaking there, that um, you both collaborated for the first time, I think, here at Wexford some years ago. And here you are again with this piece that, as you've just pointed out, is very typical of the challenge that uh, Wexford will allow. Um, well, this is your fourth collaboration, I think it is? is it is fourth our fourth yes. collaboration. The first one, in fact, it was our first show together. This is where we say, you know, we... we, uh, we Wexford all... created a monster. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a double-headed monster. Um, <laughs> but yes, it was CG Terroir with a young tenor that was at the time Joseph Calea. Yeah. And uh, then we came back for Penelope by Fauré, which was a, a score I always wanted to, to, to stage. Then we came back with Thérèse and La Navarrese by Massenet. And Il Bravo is actually our first Italian opera. All yes. the others were done in French. Yes, were yes. the French, French operas. And yeah, now exactly. we're living in Italy. What a strange coincidence. In Venice. <laughs> in Venice. <laughs> And so there you have it, a truly residential perspective from the Venetian-based duo that is Barb and Doucet. And our Beat 
And so at the end of Act Two, we discover Theodora, who's throwing a glamorous ball in her magnificent Venetian residence as the Bravo arrives and with him, Violetta, disguised under a veil as a Greek. Theodora's emotional outburst astounds the great and the good of Venice. As it would, having suddenly set fire to her own home, but she is nevertheless now reunited with her daughter. However, the Bravo himself remains in hot pursuit. Severio Mercadante's Il Bravo, written in three acts with its libretto, by Gaetano Rossi and Marco Marcello, first performed at La Scala Milan back in March of 1839. And our creative team this evening is led by director Renaud Doucet and set and costume designer André Barbe. And conducting the Wexford Festival Opera, Orchestra and Chorus, Jonathan Brandani. Paul Herriot with you here on Opera Night, coming to you live from the Wexford Festival Opera 2018 on RT Lyric FM, across the European Broadcast Union and video streamed live on rte.ie forward slash culture. Well, our international cast this evening includes Rubens Pelizzari as Il Bravo, Gustavo Castillo as Foscari, Alessandro Luciano is Pisani, Luigi is Simon Meklinski, Theodora Yasko Sato, and in the role of Violetta, Ekaterina Bakanova. Well, in our second interval this evening, one of America's foremost experts on opera, Fred Plotkin, reflects on his own personal view of the movers and shakers in the world of opera today. <laughs> If I were to talk to you about the movers and shakers in opera, I, I would want to point out that opera being this most complex art form, it has many people you don't see and hear on the stage. And all of these people, and ones that I'll be talking to you about specifically, are fundamental to keep this art form rich and diverse and very, very difficult to stage. So let me begin with the executives, people who run opera companies or festivals. I've selected two, although there are many fine ones. I think that opera would, would die out if we didn't have singers who were prepared to act and, who direct, and directors who you know, otherwise wouldn't want to work with them. So, right. um, and we would lose our audience. Peter Gelb. He's the general manager of the Metropolitan Opera since 2006. It's the largest opera company in the world, so inevitably that makes him a mover and a shaker. He is most famous, I believe, for the introduction of HD, high definition. We're coming to you from the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City. I'm Mary Jo Heath, and we are thrilled to Internationally transmitted the operas live from the Met stage that happen 10 times a season to audiences around the world. This inevitably has changed the way we see and we hear opera. I think it's a mixed blessing in that we focus more on the visual with HD and less on the musical. And opera, to me, is a musical art form first, but also a great theatrical one. And the eye is forced when we watch HD to move where the camera director chooses. I was watching recently an older opera video, and the camera remained focused on the singer for the entire aria. And frankly, that's the way that we look at opera. When someone is singing, we probably are not looking off in all kinds of different directions. But that said, HD has brought opera to communities that have never seen it. And if that's the only opera they have available to them, then that's excellent. But 
I always believe that there is nothing more thrilling than a live opera experience, primarily because the acoustics are incomparable in a way that you would never get in the cinema. The other very important executive is named Helga Robel Stadler. And although she's very important, she's not as prominent to the public eye. She's the president of the Salzburg Festival since 1995. The Salzburg Festival has the broadest artistic program of the world. We feature opera, drama, and concert. Only the best artists are invited to Salzburg. The artistic quality is the true idea of the festival founders. This festival is a huge gathering each summer of stars, singers, conductors, stage directors, artist managers, record company executives, and also there are many wealthy audience members who go there, and they are major donors to their own arts organizations back home. So it's sort of the Woodstock of opera every summer, and people go there to see what's happening and to see and be seen. Then there's the category of the producers, also called the stage directors, but in opera they're called producers. And a big challenge in opera is making it sensible and understandable to audiences. And I believe the best way to do that is to intimately learn the operas, both the music and the words in the original language. And then if they want to take this original material and place it in another context, it has to be based on the original work. And to me, the most talented stage director working today in opera is named Robert Carson. He's from Canada, but he lives in Europe. And his productions find great favor with audiences and singers alike, which is very unusual. He does mild updatings of settings and times of the operas, but they're always very faithful to the ideas and especially the emotions of the originals. His Falstaff by Verdi is set in the 1950s, but it's very funny and sentimental, and it's shared by many of the great opera companies of Europe and North America. I always say to my uh, team in, in the Commercial Oper, particularly in Berlin, that we must always remember, although we love what we do, we must remember that it's a privilege to do what we do. Barry Kosky, who is an Australian, but he lives in Berlin, and he's the artistic director of the Komische Oper, the comic opera. And his productions are bright, original, creative, and they strike chords with contemporary audiences, which is very important. Many opera companies rent them, which brings income and positive attention to his company, which was always thought of as the third company in Berlin, but now it's the one generating most of the heat and attention in that very musical city. Fella McDermott is an actor and director from Manchester who's a visionary director who creates beautiful stage pictures using very simple materials, little bits of paper, little bits of light and color. In other words, he doesn't spend a lot of money on the productions, and he substitutes his creativity by doing very strong direction. You watch his productions, and it's really theater, but based on the music. And he, like Carson and Kosky, works with the music. He's inspired by the music rather than working against it. Then there are the conductors, the maestro. Maestro means the boss. It also means the teacher. And these tend to be people who are inspirational. The image of the autocratic maestro like Toscanini is really a thing of the past. They are now first among equals. They're leaders, they're inspirers, they're collaborators. And one of the most important is named Yannick Nezay Sagan. I see how people believe passionately about opera, and that gives me hope. I won't be the one, I won't revolutionize anything. I will just come and try that everyone else we come back to the why we do this. And that will inform, hopefully, the decisions we make in the future. And he's from Montreal, and he's the principal conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and is the music director designated of the Metropolitan Opera. He takes over in 2020. Then there's Valery Gergiev, a controversial figure, but no doubt inspiring the way a maestro has to be. 
and he became assistant conductor of the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg in 1978 and chief conductor 10 years later. He made the Mariinsky one of the top opera companies in the world and trained and launched generations of great opera singers, including Dmitry Vorostovsky and Anna Netrebko, all of whom dominate stages all over the opera world. And then there is John Andrea Nozeda from Italy. This makes me feel even more the responsibility to continue in uh, my conducting career and try to achieve always the quality I would like really to present to the audience all over the world. He was a pupil of Gergiev who went from Italy to Russia, where he learned how to resourcefully run an opera house using what resources you had and not wasting money. But to do it in a brilliant, exciting way, he was music director of the BBC Philharmonic and is about to become the chief conductor of the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington. He has made the Teatro Reggio in Turin, a rival to La Scala in Italy, which is quite something, taken it on international tours and made all of it work financially, which in Italy, the birthplace of opera, is a nation that also faces many challenges in the arts. So Nozeda and his company is a success story. Now, we go to opera primarily to hear the singers. And I'm asked all the time, every day, why there are no good opera singers anymore. And I always respond that there are many outstanding young opera singers who come from all over the world, including Ireland. The difference is that opera singers are not prominent figures in the media the way they once were, say Luciano Pavarotti, Maria Callas, and therefore out of sight, out of mind. But it's not their fault. The two most in-demand singers right now are Russian soprano Anna Netrebko and German tenor Jonas Kaufmann, but I can think of hundreds of wonderful singers of all ages, shapes, and sizes who are brilliant, just as we listeners come in all ages, shapes, and sizes. So we look at them and we see ourselves. The Trebko and Kaufman also are very beautiful to look at, which it seems to be decided is what we want now in an opera singer. I want a great singer. These two are great singers. We have to support those who create magic on the stage through their singing. And that is something we have to unlearn. Opera singers should be treated like the rest of us, in other words, like gods, but gods who can do something that most of us mere mortals cannot do. And it's up to other people who work in opera, the costume designers, the lighting designers, the wig and makeup people, to lend a different kind of enchantment on the opera stage, but let the singers transport us musically and emotionally. That's what they do best. If I were to name just two more great singers, they would be the American Christine Gerke and the Swede Nina Stemma. Both of them genuine dramatic sopranos who sing the toughest roles in Wagner and Strauss and they make audiences deliriously happy. And let me add Joyce Di Donato, who is an outstanding mezzo, who paves her own path. She picks music that works for her. She picks music that tends to connect with audiences.
So when we hear her sing and watch her perform, we get emotional transport. She understands how to connect to the music and bring that to you. So also a magnificent artist, but there are many everywhere that you go. Then there's a category that I call a category of one. This is a real mover and a shaker. Placido Domingo, who was born in 1941. He has sung more than 140 roles, first as a tenor, now as a baritone, then who knows. And he's conducted opera for decades. He's managed opera companies in Washington and Los Angeles. He's the head of an international music foundation, singing foundation, and he's mentored generations of singers. And he's a prolific fundraiser for the arts. Then... Opera is not a museum. It's not that all the great works are in the past. We create new works nowadays. Not every work that we create is outstanding and will last, but all the bad pieces from the past we don't listen to anymore either. And my country, the United States, is experiencing a boom in new operas, and every great theater is presenting new opera. We see 30 or 40 or 50 new works a year. We have many talented composers. I will name three. Jake Hagee, who wrote Dead Men Walking, Kevin Putz, who wrote Silent Night that was seen in Wexford, and Laura Kaminsky, who wrote an opera called As One, a very interesting opera with a baritone and a mezzo-soprano about a transgender person, and we meet this person and the two voices. It's a real work of art. What they all have in common is a man named Mark Campbell, a very talented and very busy librettist who had five world premieres in 2017. Of the Irish singers who I like very much, Menzo Tara Arat is probably the most famous graduate in her Metropolitan Opera debut in September of 2017. But there are many more. There are Menzo's Paula Murray and Naomi O'Connell, Sopranos Claudia Boyle and Celine Byrne, tenor Robin Trichler, and baritone Gavin Ring, but there are dozens and dozens of wonderful other Irish singers. In Africa, in Cape Town, there's a wonderful movement happening in opera, and it's all due to a man named Kamal Khan, who has been training a large school of outstanding singers who already benefit from the South African choral tradition to make the chorus of the Cape Town Opera the best in the world right now. And many of these people go abroad as soloists, and the most famous is a lovely soprano named Pretty Yende. Then there are educators who train musicians and designers, but also those who spread opera to the public. That is part of my job. When done badly, opera education for the public can be dreary and pedantic. And I believe that opera is for everyone and anyone who's open to its passions and its pleasures. So I see opera as a source of pleasure and meaning. And that brings me to, I think, the ultimate mover and shaker in opera, and that's you, the audience member. Sometimes the audience feels ignored if they don't care for a new opera or a production, or if a singer just does not compare to Joan Sutherland, Luciano Pavarotti, or whoever your favorite singer is. The wonderful thing is that listening to opera on radio provides you with the ability to fire your imagination. 
you listen to the music, you picture the settings, the singers, you identify with the passions of the music and the story that is conveyed to you. But I ask you, audience member and ultimate mover and shaker in opera, to take a chance on the new, on the different, and not just the tried and true. And then opera will be great because of you. with Paul Harriet. And our thanks there to Fred Plotkin, one of the foremost experts in the field, with his own personal reflection on you the current movers and shakers in the world of opera. Paul Harriet with you here at the National Opera House in Wexford. Il Bravo is one of Mercadante's most interesting and successful...
Oh, <laughs> 
tra un'ora la morte e l'incendiaria te vuoi. Oh, 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 oh,
Theodora is sentenced to death but beats the establishment and her unwilling husband's duty to do the deed by seizing Carlo's sword and stabbing herself in the chest. A messenger arrives with that last minute reprieve announcing the death of Carlo's father but alas it is all too late as he collapses over his dead wife's prostate body bringing to an end this performance of Severio Mercadante's Il Bravo, performed at La Scala Milan for the first time in 1839. Our creative team this evening, led by director Renaud Doucet, set and costume designer André Bard, and our musical director Jonathan Brandani, as our principals take their bows now. Beginning there with the Il Bravo, Rubens Pelizzara, and Ekaterina Bakanova as Violette, followed by Yasko Sato as Teodora and Alessandro Luciano as Pisani. Applause for the chorus of Wexford Festival Opera, the chorus master Errol Gerdelstone. Luigi and Amesso with Simon Maklinski and Richard Schaffrey. Marco and Michelina, Toninecic and Joanna, Konstantin Pipileia. Oscar y Gustavo Castillo. And Pisani was Alessandro Luciano. Teodora Yasco Sato. Katarina Bakanova in the role of Viola. And Il Bravo himself, Rubens Pilizzari. Rubens Pilizzari acknowledging this very enthusiastic response from a full house here at the National Opera House in Wexford. So there they are, a full cast and chorus of this production of Il Bravo with the Wexford Festival Opera Orchestra, leader Fanula Hunt, conducted by Jonathan Brandani, who now takes his place, acknowledging his fellow musicians in the pit this evening. and this extraordinary cast. The director, Renaud Doucet, set and costume designer, André Barb, and lighting designer, Paul Hackenmuller.
And as the applause continues here at the National Opera House, Paul Harriet with you on this special opera night on RT Lyric FM, coming to you live from the stage here in Wexford, our first broadcast from this year's Wexford Festival Opera. I'm joined by our listeners from around Europe, courtesy of the European Broadcasting Union, along with those of you watching our live video stream on rt.ie forward slash culture and all our RT Lyric FM radio listeners. Our Lyric production team, in McGlynn, production coordinator, Richard McCulloch, Gar Duffy, and Seamus O'Martha on sound and producer, Gail Henry. I'm Paul Herriot, thanking you for joining us. Next week, we bring you the European premiere of William Balcombe's